everyone. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, it's good to see all of our attendees um, joining us live as they come in. Um, very exciting. Um, and if you're watching this as a recording, thanks for tuning in. Uh, today's webinar is going to focus on getting some diverse and expert perspectives from our incredible panelists um, on three related topics. The first is around the journey they've been on in driving customer centricity within their organizations. Uh, we'll talk about the challenges they've faced and the successes and learnings they might have had. The second is around the role of culture, uh, specifically in overcoming barriers to become more customer centric. Uh, you know, how they think about culture and what are some ways to harness culture as a critical ingredient um, in driving change. And the third is their views on pragmatic things that leaders can do in organizations to perhaps jumpstart or accelerate their journey toward customer centricity. You know, this can be uh, you know, ranging from organization structure uh, modifications or perhaps more working more effectively within um, existing structures. This is also a topic of research uh, that Profit has published. Uh, and if you haven't downloaded it yet, it, you'll find a link uh, in the description section of this webinar. So with that said, I'm really excited to welcome our panelists. We have Beth Wood, Chief Marketing Officer at Principal Financial Group, um, Andrea Schultz, um, Head of Workplace Retirement Marketing at Equitable, and Kai Sackstra, uh, Chief Strategy Officer at US Bank. I'll turn it over to each of them to share a bit more about themselves momentarily. But before I do that, just a bit about myself. Uh, I'm Saur Wahi. I'm a partner in Profit's Digital Discipline, and I co-lead our financial services practice. Um, and Profit, for those who aren't as familiar, is a digitally powered, creatively inspired transformation consultancy. Uh, we take a human-centered lens to everything we do, and this is part of the reason why we focused on the topic of executing against customer centricity uh, for our research and for this webinar. Um, I'll be facilitating this discussion today with my colleague, Chia Chen. So with that said, Beth, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning. Um, my name is Beth Wood, and as the slide indicates, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Principal. Uh, I've spent... Um, a bunch of my career in consumer packaged goods, also spent some time as an accidental entrepreneur. So thinking about what one of our target markets, small to medium sized businesses go through every single day. And at principle, we are focused on driving transformative growth for the business. And we think that focusing on customer centricity is a key piece of that. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Andrea, would you like to introduce yourself? And I'm not sure if, uh, there we go. We have your video too, excellent. Hi there, uh, my name is Andrea Schultz. I lead workplace retirement marketing at Equitable. Um, I spent the first half of my career at advertising agencies where I worked on a lot of different consumer brands um, and then accidentally fell into financial services in the second part of my career. Um, I've been at Equitable for about a year. Prior to that, I was um, at TIA where I led, um, where I had a, a number of roles ranging from customer experience to building out our direct to consumer strategy. So. I've always found that I um, sat in, had a seat at the table where I was really bringing things back to the customer, given my agency background. Very excited to have your perspective, Andrea. Uh, Kai, would you like to go next? Sure thing. Kai Sackstrup. I'm Chief Strategy Officer at U.S. Bank, and uh, you know my career has been been varied. I've run two small businesses. I've been a consultant, and this is my second stint in large corporate America. And as Chief Strategy Officer at U.S. Bank, that can mean a lot. I mean, strategy is, is, a, is a very generic term and what that, that means. But, but the U.S. Bank, at least, is traditional strategy, strategic planning. We also um, do strategic execution. So how do we make sure one strategy is right? Do we have the right outcome metrics, change management, et cetera, place to deliver upon that? Um, I also lead our, our enterprise analytics team, so all of our data science um, reports up through me. And then the most relevant today is we're really embarking on what we're, we're calling segment activation. How do we really take a lot of what we think when it comes to the ways to drive customer centricity and make it a reality in the bank? Terrific. Really excited to uh, hearing from, from you, Kai. Um, I'll tell you over to Chad to introduce himself, and then he'll give us a quick overview of what our research uncovered about executing against customer centricity. And then we'll turn it over to the star of the show, our panelists, to hear from them about their own observations. Um, just a quick sort of housekeeping note for anyone joining live, please feel free to post questions to our panelists in the chat section. Uh, we'll make, make sure we uh, pick up a few of these questions during our last 10 minutes for a quick uh, Q&A. 
So with that said, Cha, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thanks a lot, Sorb. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, hi, my name is Cha Chen, and I'm a partner at Profit focused on helping companies, particularly in the financial services space, grow by adopting and using digital to stay connected to their customers. So I'm really thrilled uh, to be here in, the, in such an august company. Um, so now I just want to give you a little bit of an overview of the study. So Michelle, if you want to go to the next slide. Yeah, the, it's a product of in-depth interviews and uh, in, with nearly 50 financial services executives. And through these interviews, we've um, developed a deeper understanding of the challenges specific to financial services institutions as they look to market, sell, and serve the whole customer. Um, as an integrated um, you know, face to those customers. So, the, and these challenges range uh, from organization structures that are consequences of historically strong orientations through, to products, to the after effects of mergers and acquisitions that have been a part of many large financial services companies development. And of course, our regulatory barriers that often make it difficult to share data around individual customers between business units. So regardless, though, when we talked to these executives, almost all the leaders that we interviewed pointed to the critical importance of culture change to making progress in the, to the, on the journey of executing on customer centricity. And when we dove deeper into what a customer centric culture would look like, we found that uh, how the, these leaders define culture resonates strongly with how we define it a profit, which is a holistic and evolving embodiment of an ecosystem that includes not just a company's purpose, values, brand, and strategy, which, as you'll see in the slide, uh, when taken together, we call the organization's DNA, but also its body, which is its organization, governance, process, systems, and tools, its mind, talent, capabilities, and its soul, mindsets, behaviors, motivations, stories, symbols, and rituals. And so this holistic approach to culture is at the core of the human-centered transformation model that we have at Profit, and the lens through which we identify the actions and moves needed to change culture. So in the report, we mapped the specific actions. I think you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, uh, uncovered uh, in our research the different components of the, um, the, the human-centered transformation model, DNA, body, mind, soul. And we're excited to bring some of those insights to life today with our panel. So now without any more, uh, any more uh, delay, let's start the panel discussion. Back to you, Sora. Great, thanks, Chad. So um, to our panelists, you know, the topic of customer centricity has been around for several years. It's not a, uh, this is not a 2021 to 2022 dynamic. This has very much been around for a few years now. And no doubt there's been a ton of experimentation, trial and error, and perhaps you know, things that you witnessed or led in your own experiences that, uh, that you've learned from and, and you know, evolved your thinking against. So uh, with that context, I'll start with two, a two-part question perhaps. Uh, first, when you think about your journey toward customer centricity in your organization, what are some capabilities that you've invested in and developed that have meaningfully advanced your, uh, your journey. Um, and a second part of the question is, what else is required? What else comes to mind uh, to become truly customer centric? What's missing from the category of the business today? Andrea, perhaps I'll turn it over to you to start with. Cool, thank you. Um, so as you're asking the question, I think you know it sounds a little bit obvious, but I think the first thing that an organization really needs to invest in is truly knowing their customers. Um, I think a lot of organizations think that they know their customers, but they don't have anything set up for a repeatable feedback loop to really understand, you know, how their messages are hitting customers, how customers are experiencing them on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's a significant investment as well as a um, mentality shift for the organization. Um, and then I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? It, you know, what else is required in your mind to perhaps, you know, continue or even accelerate the journey? Yeah, so I think that knowing the customer is the first thing. I also think that in my experience, a customer experience function is a great place to start, um, but it's really not the ultimate place to land. I think that following the notion of a customer experience organization, it really needs to be embedded into the business rather than sitting alongside of it, because I think that there's a lot that has to do with decision-making authority and without that authority, it's really difficult to enact change, especially as Cha had mentioned, a lot of financial services companies at this point are really 
Um, there have been a lot of mergers and acquisitions and different cultures coming into play. And so I think that without authority, it's really difficult to institute any change. Really, really good point. Beth, how would you add to that? Yeah, I can only build on that because I agree completely with what Andrea said. Um, you know, from a capability standpoint, I agree, know your customer. The other thing that's been an aha moment for us is that the foundational work is so critical. You can't get subsumed by the bright, shiny objects, you know, the new sexy technologies that are out there. You have to do the hard work that gets you voice of customer, that helps you harmonize your data and help you, helps you access your data in a compliant way. So we've been spending a lot of time on data cleansing and data harmonization, working through tech debt, like most financial, secure, uh, financial services companies are working through, and trying to keep ourselves from getting too mesmerized by the sexy technologies that are out there, especially in the direct-to-consumer space, which there's a lot of stuff to love, uh, but we have to stay focused on the founda foundation. Um, and then the second thing I think we've really tried to embrace here culturally is to empathize with our customers. We have three customer communities that we co-create with, and that's proved to be invaluable in terms of just understanding what each touch point means to our customers and how we can learn from their unique experience. In terms of what else, um, I would build on what Andrea said. You know, I think there are capabilities that are common across your business units that you need to have at the center. You want to create that enterprise leverage, those efficiencies in those common capabilities. But then admittedly, there are some very unique things that must be in the business unit. Those folks are closest to the customer. They have the authority to make those those changes uh, to their customer experience and their user experience. And so it really does become a partnership. And I love the concept of bridges and open doors and open windows between business units that Profit has, has offered up. That, that really struck a chord with us. That's great. Yeah, the, the point around um, avoiding the distractions is really, really critical because that we often see in our, in our work um, it can be mesmerizing to kind of chase, chase sure. interesting, interesting, you know, very unique, but subscale uh, in terms of harnessing the entire organization's power to drive customer centricity. Kai, I'd love to hear your perspective on, on those two questions. You know, what's, what's been your, uh, you know, what are some capabilities that you invested in that have really advanced your journey? And, you know, what from your perspective are uh, things that really still need to be done? I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I love what, what Beth and Andrea said. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think, you know, just put a fine point on the data elements. I mean, I think, you know, we have so much information about our, our customers. And some of it, you know, is certainly the voice of the customer and understanding sentiment and, and all of that. But just 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 really, really robust data. And so I think just, just getting that customer 360 view so we can truly understand the depth of the relationship, how they engage with us the channels that they prefer, all of that. I think they really have a credible um, relationship, personal relationship with customers that's critical. That man, that's, that's so much easier said than done. It's incredibly hard, but I think that's really, really foundational. And I think, you know, I think it, we'll get into this a little bit more, but I think it's just there's such a big cultural mindset shift that is required to actually become customer centric because you have a lot of conversations like this with, with, with people who drive revenue directly in the business. You can even sometimes offend them because you can have a response of, gosh, I think about my customer 24 seven. So, so, so what do you mean customer centricity? I've been doing this my entire career. And I think there, there is, is some mindset shift that needs to be required um, sometimes. And so, well, you may be thinking about your customer from a very, very important yet narrow lens. So how do we actually expand the aperture to really think about the whole customer relationship and frankly think of it from the customer's perspective? Because oftentimes in big organizations, financial institutions or otherwise, you know, a customer may be, you know, working with four or five different parts of an organization and they shouldn't see our org chart. They should feel like there is a seamless experience. And oftentimes when we think we're very focused on our customer. We can create five different customer experiences within one organization. That's certainly not customer centric, and that's not what customers expect. I love I that. Love, I'd love to build on what you just said. Um, there was something that Cha and I spoke about a lot when we were um, when he was interviewing me for the paper, and that was that um, a lot of times investments in customer centricity 
it's really difficult to build the business case for it. And so uh, Kai, I was hearing what you said about, you know, people get offended. And I think that organizations really need to play the long game. Um, these are not wins that you're going to realize on a balance sheet in a year. Um, and I think there's typically a lot of trepidation around thinking about things really a couple of years out. And then also proving that value that an improved customer experience will have on business results. That's also in my experience been a very difficult thing to prove um, in a business case format. All really, really critical points. Speaking about, you know, uh, sort of understanding the the business case behind it. How do you, how do you, in a bit of a probe on the on the topic. How do you, uh, what signals do you look for to build conviction that you're making meaningful progress? You know, a, you know, customer centricity tends to be such a uh, large, amorphous, sometimes hard to grapple kind of concept. Uh, you know, how do you build conviction within your own? teams and your organization that, hey, this is this is progress. This is how we can point to something and say there's progress. And, and ultimately, it does, does deliver business value. Andrea, would you like to continue on that thought? Yeah. I mean, I think net promoter score is obviously the big one, mm -hmm. um, but it's really difficult to tease apart what um, factors drove that net promoter score. I think that to the extent that it's possible to seek that type of feedback at the end of each communication through a phone survey or a web survey or soliciting some sort of feedback around how customers felt the interaction went and the likelihood to continue or grow the business as a result of that. Those are the types of metrics that I think really can drive change um, because they're kind of universal in terms of how people understand them. I think that in a more macro perspective, just having more people sitting around the table thinking about and talking about the customer and constantly bringing up the customer and not only talking about what business outcome is this going to drive, but what customer outcome is this going to drive. I think when you start hearing people talk about the customer in terms of the outcomes you're trying to drive and that kind of escalates within the organization, that's another huge win. That's a bit of a leading indicator, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. Beth, I love your thoughts on this. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, and, and, you know, financial services companies are so focused on the ultimate business outcome, right? And the, the leading indicators of what customers perceive and how they feel it is so important. We've used these communities that we have to help us understand at a deeper level, a more granular level, an empathy level with the customer. What's really going on? What are how are we making you feel every time you have an interaction with us? And you know, I love and I, this is probably a trademark violation, but I love the Mastercard campaign that talks about the things that are priceless because I think we have to remember. I know we all want to know the size of the prize, but we have to remember that some of these customer sentiments. You can't put a number on it to Andrea's point. It takes a very long time to shift that behavior. And so I think setting the stage for executives to understand that at the beginning is critical. And you either believe that the customer is a critical part of your value proposition or you don't. Mm -hmm. And then as you get into it and you start to move that, spin that flywheel, then you can start demonstrating leading at indicators, even lagging indicators that help people believe that there is in fact business value here. We've had a similar conversation around ESG in this industry, right? So what is the value of ESG to an investor? And how do you put a, a number on that? And we've basically said, you know, ESG is about turning your values into business value. And we're starting to be able to prove the size of investor pools that are interested in ESG related products and companies that practice good ESG governance and the like. And I think the same is true for customer centricity. We're just going to have to get into it and prove it one step at a time. Kai, any bills on that? Yeah, I think I would just say is, and you know, it's funny because you know, I, 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 I've tried to do this multiple organizations in my career and stuff my toe a few times along the way. So I've learned a few things. And one of the things that, that I have learned is that um, to the best you can define, what are some of the, the, the customer behaviors that we'll see when we know we're actually achieving customer centricity? So, so let's say it's depth of relationship you see, it's certain engagement and behavior models, you see them actually doing certain things that you'd say this is proof that we're actually pushing the needle. 
And the good news from there is, is if you've defined that and you've aligned on that, then you can actually take your analytics team and you can say, well, how do we actually see when we see these behavior shifts, does it, does it lead to, to less attrition? Does it lead to greater customer value over time, current and, and, and future value? Does it actually empower our marketing team to have better messages and more succinct um, engagement models such that our, our cost per acquisition numbers uh, can be positively impacted? So I think if financial services firms need to see the financial benefit to actually believe in something, I think it's, it is those two steps, clearly defining the behaviors that will show we're winning and then actually proving to, to business leaders that this actually leads to better outcomes. Yeah, that's great. Um, Kai, I know you touched a bit on uh, the role of shifting culture and shifting mindsets. So I'm gonna hand it over to Cha. He's gonna dial a little bit deeper into that topic and draw a line of questioning around that. Cha. Great, thanks a lot, Sorb. So, and one of the, so one of the, as we talked about earlier, one of the, you know, as throughout this discussion, like a big part of like changing, uh, getting, achieving, uh, better customer centricity is the uh, the need to actually drive lasting culture change. So and as you th think about your particular organizations, what are some of the, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about uh, some of them already, but what are some of the, the ways that culture might enable uh, your ability to become customer centric, right? And, and Beth, and I'm going to like to, to kind of hand it back to you for a second, because you started down this path already and, you know, and cer certainly kind of, creating these kind of customer advisory panels. Um, but, what, uh, but what are the things that you're doing kind of within uh, the principle to kind of um, to, to change the culture and actually to drive that towards a better customer centricity? Yeah, I'll try to be very practical and tactical here, Shai, if I can. Um, I would focus on a, a market that we have identified as a place where we have a right to win in the market and where we have some preferred access, and that is the small and medium-sized business market. And so we work in an intermediated world, and small business owners and their employees are an important part of our customer base. And so the place we started was 101 segmentation. Um, let's get to know the different pools of customers and the different attitudes and using human-centered design, getting into the mindsets of these customers, and then working side-by-side -side with your business partner was critical. You can't do that stuff in the marketing silo and bring it like a gift and say, look what, I, look what I've learned about your customers. They have to take the journey with you. And so we took the journey together with the business that was focused on the small and medium-sized business market. And now it's fascinating to hear the business talking about the real nuances of behavior and leading indicator metrics that are suggesting that this pathway or this piece of content um, captures customer sentiment better than this does. That never used to happen. It was more about selling what we could make, not making what we could sell. Now we understand what's in the headset of the customer and we're thinking about our products differently. We're thinking about our distribution and our marketing communications differently. And the other piece that we used in this, in this journey was uh, we have a small business community and we created some small business partnerships with companies like Inc. 5000 and Fast Company who gave us access to business owners who were willing to come on our platforms and talk about the things that keep them up at night. So really just rolling up your sleeves with a business in partnership to get into the mindset of your customer was critical, taking it out of the theoretical and the academic into the practical every day. That's, I mean, that sounds, that sounds fabulous. I mean, it, it, it feels like there's a, a little bit of a theme around, like, how do you actually really shine a light, right, into a specific customer segment or you know just this uh, even like specific use case possibly right so like so that you're really getting the business to be able to see it. this is you know this is how we're actually um, interacting with these customers and you know is that uh, is that right yeah i mean it's it's really kai's uh you know area of expertise which is strategy right and you have to help them understand this is your differentiators your access to this market and the narrative that you're sharing with this very specific segment and so if you help them understand that this is your opportunity to scale and to find a a profit pool that you can tap into now the economic engine of the business starts running and they go ah oh, okay customers are an avenue toward delivering on transformative business growth 
and being able to scale that. But uh, I'll flip it over to Kai because I think he probably has some thoughts around how you take that customer segmentation and translate it into real, really relevant business strategy for the business. Yeah, you're happy to comment, and I'll even just you know take one step up before I get to that. As I, as I think, you know, winning the hearts and minds of the most senior leaders um, in an organization is just it's critical. I think it's it's not sufficient, but it's critical. And I think one of the one of the the great things about sort of a, a siloed um, business is is that the the CEO, however he or she wants to run his or her business can move, move at lightning speed when you can just make decisions that are very, very focused on the, the, the singular goal of driving my specific P&L. And so I think when you actually do want to get to that segmented approach and, and want to have sort of that holistic view, you have to win the hearts and minds of the top of the house, in my opinion, to really, to really have a chance at pulling this off and get on this marathon, as we've talked about. It's not a sprint. This is a, this is a long slog. Um, but from there, you really have to then that, then move down into, into, into the people within the organization that, that, that actually do the work day to day, because I don't believe any, there's too many decrees that come from the top of the house that magically just lead to action. And so I think having to then also win the hearts and minds and help people understand, you know, where you're coming from and ask them the right questions, because I think oftentimes, um, you know, absent organization change or incentive changes, it can be really hard to, to affect behavior. And, 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 and so, and especially a behavior that's been rewarded and been very good behavior for a long time. And I think one of the things that you, people in, in chairs like ours need to do is actually take a step back and, and, and check our egos at the door and actually listen to the people that we're asking to change. Because oftentimes when we're coming in and speaking on change agendas, uh, the, the, it can be, feel like it's a judgment. And it's coming and assuming you're doing the wrong thing or can't believe you all made this decision five years ago and look where it left us today. And I like to come these conversations with the assumption is that most decisions that were made at a company were prudent and very good ones at the time. But that doesn't mean that you'd remake them today. And so if you can get to a point where you're sitting on the same side of the table figuratively and across and say, you know, if we believe this is what customers want today. And we had the ability to completely reshape our organization today and build it from scratch. What would it look like? Would we build it this way? Would customers want us to build this way? Do leading it into industries, do fintechs build themselves this way? Is this the way Starbucks is constructed? And I think when you can start to have sort of an expansive conversation like that, you can start to find common ground. And then once you have common ground, you can start to get specifics and start to get to some of those changes. And, and while those of us who are, are, have that change DNA in us, you, you want to treat this as a sprint and you want to say within two quarters, we're going to transform this business. I think that's the wrong approach. You have to realize this is a marathon and there'll be milestones along the way. But how do you incrementally keep moving forward? I need somebody to believe in the segmentation and then find a segment that, that, that is one where you can can. can do a test or experiment to actually prove the concept and agree that if this works, how do we expand it and, and continue to think expansively that way? So I think it's very easy to sort of you know, come off as judgmental. We're smarter than you and we're going to save you. And I think I, I would challenge anybody to show us when you come in with, with, with that mindset, how it's ever succeeded. And so I think there's a lot of humility that's required from people in our chairs need to appreciate the past as we try and build a bridge to the future. That's, I mean, that's, that, that is, uh, that's, that's, that's amazing. I think that this idea also just of making sure that uh, you are putting yourself on the same side of the table, right. As the people you're really trying to, to kind of try to drive different behaviors out of, right. Is like super important. Right. And because I think, like in the context of a large organization, it, I think Kai, what you're also saying is that like customer centricity is one of a number of choices that they can, that these business leaders can, and this, these businesses and organizations can make, right. In order to drive growth, in order to, you know, to achieve kind of the overall kind of business outcomes. Right. So it is a lot about like having that empathy for the rest of the organization to get to, okay, so how do we make sure that, how do we, how do we how do we how do we actually you know uh, uh, use customer centricity in a way that really resonates with uh, with the kind of the, the needs of that business right so um, like that's a that's a and I think Andrea like I would love to get your kind of take on the experiences that you've had in you know where like the the, the maybe the organization was conceptually willing 
but but like there had some difficulties in really kind of being able to execute on on this idea of customer centricity. I think that so much of it, unfortunately, comes down to the org chart. Fortunately, unfortunately, and the accountabilities and the incentives. Um, I've been in situations where customer experience sat um, outside of marketing. I've been in experiences where customer experience sat inside of marketing. And now at Equitable, actually, customer experience sits both within the business as well as in marketing. We have business line customer experience, and then we also have enterprise customer experience. I think that that kind of organizational structure from my from what I've seen so far does lead to really great outcomes because we have the people whose day to day working in the business, seeing their customer groups, um, really truly understanding their business line and the end needs of their customer coupled with how do we increase share of wallet by looking at things across the enterprise and that's being happening out of marketing. Um, to me, that's led to really great results. But to your point, that's a significant investment on the part of the organization to invest in multiple customer experience arms. But I do think that um, as we move from trying to be more of a product manufacturer to more of a holistic financial services provider, that sort of investment is really necessary. Fantastic. Um, I know this is a, this is a great discussion. Of, you know, and as we kind of get into um, this idea of you know kind of the organization structure being critical, I want to turn it back over to, to Sora, to you know who's got some additional questions around um, the role of the org structure in customer centricity. Sora. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The, you know, uh, I, I was having a great conversation this morning with with a colleague, and uh, a quote from a from a well regarded author came to mind, which is. Um, you don't, uh, you know, the author's name is James Clear, and, and the quote is, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems, which, uh, Andrea, just kind of illustrates the point you were describing, where the role of systems and the organization structure and all of the different uh, operating model choices apparent within that um, really kind of drive the outcome at the end of the day rather than an aspirational goal alone. So so building on that theme, um, you know, we, we talk about, um, you know, I mean, we think about customer centricity, there's a, there's a really fashionable idea of saying, well, let's, let's break down the silos. Um, and, you know, in theory, it sounds, sounds very attractive, um, this idea of having, um, you know, fluid conversations without any sort of barriers to, to impede them. But that being said, in practice, it's not always very pragmatic or possible to do that. So, you know, when you think about the balance between you know, breaking down silos on one end, uh, or perhaps opening up windows between these silos to uh, allow for a free flow of information about customers. How do you consider what success looks like, you know, in achieving the right balance, in, you know, perhaps in your organization? So uh, maybe Kyle, I'll start with you. How do you think about this, this idea of having the right structure in place to support customer centricity? Great question. I think so many calories are burned by people in roles such as ours thinking through, gosh, if we could just have a magic wand and, and recreate a new organizational structure, you know, magically things would be better. And there's, there's no doubt there's optimal organization structures and suboptimal, but I think, you know, what, what I have, have sort of come to realize is in many ways, regardless of what you're organized, there's always going to be some sort of matrix and complexity in any large organization. And so, so, you know, rather than spending a lot of time trying to, to influence that, which I think can be very hard, particularly when there's regulatory agencies that are used to a certain reporting structures, financial systems are built, it is exactly what describes are. How do you, how do you open up windows and within uh, an existing organizational structure, try to optimize what we can do? And, and so I think, you know, that, that is where it comes back again to winning some of our hearts and, and minds that I've talked about a little bit earlier, because I think, you know, some simple things that we've just seen successful here is, is how do you just get revenue line leaders that, that have a similar goal in the room consistently talking about the shared experience? And as simple as that sounds, just creating forums and dialogues where people can, can, can start to create those connections. And, and once you sort of start to get that and build some of those relationships, particularly big organizations where, where you know, I'm always surprised at that seen this multiple times in my career, how many times you know, people that, that you assume, gosh, that's just regular connectivity actually don't. So you can start there 
I think then it goes back to, and then once you win those hearts and minds, it is some of that earning trust. It's sharing some of that data, being willing to, 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 to have a more expansive conversation that potentially makes some, some leaders uncomfortable. And I get it because, because if you've got a really strong, you know, relationship with some very important clients, the idea of exposing them to other parts of the business, which loses some control, is a scary thing. And so, so all of that is that position of empathy that I've talked about. If you can come in and deeply understand once those windows are open, what are some of those barriers and roadblocks and how can you find common ground? It doesn't mean you can overcome all of them, but, but coming back to that, that analogy I keep using, that's why this is a marathon. So sometimes you know, the goal is in a quarter just to get one more mile down the road and you may know where you want to get um, to over time, but it, it's those little victories and building trust over time. And I think, and that's exactly, you know, I think what happens when you start to open those windows. But I think you know, the, the, the organizational magic wand, I'm sure every one of us in this call has ideas on what we would do if we could head up the org structure for our, our, our entire companies. Um, and, and I think sometimes, you know, we can, we can again, burn a lot of calories without a lot of, a lot of, um, really, really good outcomes at the end of that are frankly tangible progress. And so how do you make progress without that? Uh, Andrea, Beth, any, any bills on, on uh, Kai's commentary? Yeah, I could jump in here. Um, you know, one area that we've seen that actually is helping us prioritize because in large, highly matrixed organizations, what you end up with is, is these exhaustive lists of priorities because every area has a different set of intended outcomes, business outcomes and customer outcomes. And so one of the things that we've said to folks is let's let the customer decide. And the way we do that is by being very loosely coupled but tightly aligned on who our targets are, who our personas are, and then what the journeys are that we are trying to prioritize. And then using those journeys as the center of gravity, if you will, to define priorities. So you do need the foundational data and technology stack, of course, but then as you let journeys define the, the, the prioritization and they become the center of gravity that helps you as an organization identify those places that are flashing red, as one of my leaders says oftentimes, you know, let's find those flashing red places and let's swarm and attack right, and resolve that issue. And if you remind people that customer centricity and customer experience is about the visible edge of the brand, right, you remind them that you have this intangible asset, the strategic asset that is the brand. And I love what Andrea said, that CX connected to marketing is really purposeful, but also being in the business and at the center is important because you have those teams working together. You have to remind everybody that CX is that visible edge, edge of the brand. And it's how your brand comes to life in a practical, tangible way for your customers. So I think, I think your point about org structure is spot on. We're not going to break down the silos that we need them for very specific reasons, but we have to find ways to be on the same side of the table to align on priorities and importantly, to align on strategy, not having multiple strategies by business, but having an enterprise strategy that says, Here's what our vision is. Here's our purpose, who we want to be in the world. And here are the three to five things that are going to get us there. And the customer should always be one of them. Andrea, love your thoughts on this. Yeah, I'm not sure that I have anything that new to say. I think that the tensions that Kai and Beth have both spoken about in terms of approaching it both from the top down as well as the bottom up, I think that Sometimes we lose, lose sight, especially in the remote, largely remote environment that we're all in around the value of just making connect, connections across lines of business with other business leaders, identifying efficiencies, identifying places where we're both trying to drive a similar change and potentially piggybacking off of each other's efforts or budgets or expertise. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of things, Kai, I loved your talk about waving a magic wand. I can't tell you how many org charts I've put together trying to wave that wand and, you know, have had, you know, different levels of success. But I think that we lose sight around what we can do at an individual level just by talking to people. Um, I was actually speaking to a woman that works with, for me um, earlier this week, and we were talking about the value of just having recurring one-on-ones with people that you cross paths with tangentially. 
Um, it seems obvious, but I think that when we're all sitting at home behind our computers, we, we get kind of singularly focused and stop thinking about looking broadly. So I think that's something all of us can do. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, one, one pro perhaps on, on this topic, um, Beth, you talked about uh, letting the journeys become real sort of the, 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 the clarity and, and the version of truth that, the, that can potentially align the organization. We, we, in our past, we, we've also worked with many organizations that have invested time, effort, energy in building out journeys, you know, building out the, the visibility on where the pain points really lie, the big flashing rights, to your point. How do you, how do you think about, at the same time, enhancing the organization's ability to respond to what the journey is beginning to say? You know, there's, there's a part about uh, you know, investing into having those journeys in place, which is foundational to your point. How do you then, what's the 2.0 version of boosting the organization's ability to respond uh, with speed, efficiency, and alignment to actually do something about some of those challenges that the journey has revealed? Yeah, it's a great question. And we're at the beginning of this journey, um, you know, not to overuse the word journey, but our, we are on our own journey to try to make these priority experiences a, a, a leading uh, idea inside the organization. And the short answer is, Sarab, you have to be on the same side of the table as yeah. the business. And so, you know, you bring to light, you shine a light on the customer's experience, which unlikely has been dived into at such a granular level previously. And so when you dive into that experience at a very granular level, it opens everyone's eyes. And as long as there are no egos in the room and everybody's just focused on that empty chair to borrow the Jeff Bezos, um, you know, idea, if everybody's focused on that empty chair and how we can help that customer have a better experience and build more connectivity and loyalty to the brand and to the business, I think that's important. You know, in this industry, we have so many intermediaries that we have to think about. And sometimes your brain just hurts when you think about all the different people that are engaged in a sale. Mm -hmm. I think about people who are buying financial services products at the workplace. You've got advisors, you've got plan sponsors or employers that have a, a, a role in, in the process. You've got HR leaders who have a role in the process before you even get to the person who's trying to save money or, um, you know, or, or save for their future. So um, I, I really do think it's about what Kai said. It's about being on the same side of the table. It's about being loosely coupled, but tightly aligned on what you're trying to get out of it. And then people start to see the kinks in the armor in the journey and those flashing red points that we have to go and tackle. Thanks for that perspective. Kai, uh, Andrea, anything else you'd add to this idea of enhancing an organization's ability to respond to the, the, you know, the, the challenges that the customer journey is perhaps begin to highlight? Maybe the only thing I would add is, is, is I certainly do think that, you know, well, let me take a step back. I, mean, I think you, if you take most of our businesses, I suspect there's no shortage of great ideas and, 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 and incredible intentions amongst people that, that see a problem and want to fix them. Or, or and, and, and there's just more work that can be done. And so I think when you take these journeys and you can break them down into the moments that matter, either ones using the MPS, MPS sort of lingo, like well, what's going to create a promoter, what's going to create a detractor. And I think that when you can actually get buy-in from the business, you can actually very, very much streamline the agenda. Because oftentimes I think what you find is there may be five or six things that no doubt you know, we could fix or could address but are, re, are they really going to be game changers and push the needle? If the answer is no, then I think the answer is, well, gosh, we have two really big pain points that could lead to great dissatisfaction, maybe lead to an attrition event, or going to one or two things that can delight. And I think when you put that analytical frame and rigor around it, sometimes you'll find out that they really aren't the big flashy things and everybody wants, wants to be drawn to. What's the big new flashy you know, gadget we can put out there? And oftentimes that's not really what's going to lead to, to, to the changes we want. And so getting focused on these are the four or five things with this journey that we need to accomplish in the next 12, 18 months, I think. And then when you actually can follow up with some of the metrics and data that we showed earlier, I think it builds a lot of credibility because I, I think, you know, they're, they're, the, the biggest challenge I find with a lot of most big organizations is just there's too big of agendas, too many things want to get done, and we end up peanut buttering our resources or our, our bandwidth across 50 things and we do all of them okay, 
versus being okay with 45 of them are left unaddressed and five of them we do really, really well. And I think that's one of the big value adds people and functions like ours can do um, when we support our businesses. You're here. Yeah. And I was going to say, I love customer journey mapping probably as much as anybody that's here right now. In my experience, though, taking it from an academic exercise to actually doing something with it, that's where the, that's where the rub comes in. I think, Kai, what you just said around um, the prioritization based on the business outcomes that those journeys identify is the huge piece that we often miss. Um, so we do that big academic exercise, we come out with millions of ideas, but then it's really difficult to execute sometimes. So that prioritization, I think, is huge. Right. And speaking, go ahead. I was just going to say, Kai, something you said, uh, and perhaps I, I read uh, perhaps implicitly in there, is that you're talking about this prioritization, not, not within the context of a particular business, but really across businesses where the, the leadership and, and the, you know, the folks who are driving ahead some of the prioritization really look at a macro level, serving the whole customer across all the business lines rather than within the context of a single business. Is that right? That's right. I mean, I think you have to be recognized that, 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 that there are places where that commonality matters. And so I think you know, that's where digital technologies can create consistency of experience. There's a whole host of places where that can be done. And so I think where, where we see that, that's where the strategy starts, that, that that's where you, you align on those moments, but also having to recognize that there are those moments and, and, and experiences which will be unique to individual businesses. So, so getting that balance and creating that tension right. I think when you, when, you, when you move too far to one single central view or one too far decentralized view in terms of how you create those experience and prioritizations, I think that's where, where you, you get into, in, into potentially challenges, um, obvious when you over rotate. And so, so, but it's, it's much harder to do what I just described. It's very easy if you have a clear central view and hey, all get in line or completely decentralized. When you create that appropriate tension and friction um, that leads to tough debate. I think you know that that's where I, I have seen the greatest outcomes come. But it's a lot harder to do it that way and do it well than it is just the sort of pick a you know, approach that, that goes to one of the extremes. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I'll I'll hand it over to you. Yeah. No, this is a I, no problem. This is, I think I think this is a, you know we talked a lot about process and alignment. Um, but I think in terms of like, you know, when we think about actually executing it on customer centricity, like I would love to understand, uh, you know, what you, you, you see as the biggest kind of gaps from a capability standpoint, right? In order to really execute on that. Once you kind of like have uh, aligned that this is like how we want to do these things, like what are the, the specific capabilities from a skills or technology standpoint that, you know, um, are really maybe holding you back a little bit. So, and I, you know, I'd love to start with you, Andrea. Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't call on me. That's a hard question. Um, <laughs> I think that, um, having people that really prioritize the customer above all else and not just say that they do. I think that um, a lot of executives didn't get to the place where they are with a focus on the customer. So that's not really where they default naturally. Um, I think that in my experience, it's folks within marketing organizations, within UX organizations um, that really have this, this passion, um, but not necessarily the business leaders. Um, so to me, having people that are growing up um, with a real passion for the customer, that will change things automatically. Um, I think functionally, you know, I often feel really jealous about all of the fintechs and how they don't have all of the legacy technologies that we have holding us back. Um, I think just acknowledging and recognizing that a lot of these big, um, larger, older financial services companies are in the same spot that we're in um, and that our systems are often kind of duct tape and band-aid and glued together through acquisitions and everything else. Um, and recognizing that we are not, you know, the new kids on the block that gets to start from scratch and kind of giving ourselves grace for that um, in developing our roadmaps. I think that I'm not really sure how to overcome this, but I think acknowledging that we're not alone in the struggle is a big part of it, um, like progress, not perfection. <laughs> um, so incremental moves and really not trying to 
upend the world from a back end systems perspective because we still need to keep the businesses moving forward. But I'm very curious about the other panelists as well. Yeah, Beth would love to understand so from a capability standpoint, what are the big gaps that you're really having to deal with? Yeah, um, I'm right there with Andrea. Hard question and lots of tech debt and legacy systems trying to work through. Um, you know, to tackle this, we've brought in some incredible talent. And I know talent is a big topic everywhere today, right? In social media and the news. I don't even watch the news anymore. I'm tired of hearing what they're talking about. If it's not COVID, it's the great resignation. So, you know, we know that there's a challenge here, but we have brought in some incredible talent in the data and analytics space, um, in the technology space, and also in the customer insights and engagement center space. So I think the, the talent you need to create those foundational capabilities, customer insights, critical. Customer data platform, whatever your CDP looks like, however you've connected your data to your tech stack and then ingested your analytics, it is the way that you're going to interface with your customer. And that's going to create that, 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 that flywheel, if you will, of customer experience so that it continuously gets better and we continue to learn over time. You know, how you manage consent and privacy, how you create those little moments of delight for your customer all starts with having that single source of truth for your data and then having the right connections uh, between your tech stacks. So, you know, those are the foundational things, but they don't operate without the talent and without the ideas. And I often say, you know, in the absence of a strategy, every idea is a good idea. Well, when you have a clear strategy and you align the right talent to the strategy and the intended business outcomes, and then you have your, this is really important to me, you have your C-suite aligned on what you're trying to do. Because if you don't say it over and over and over again, you're never going to build it. And you're certainly not going to act on it. So you need to put a stake in the ground right at the top of the house that says, this is important. This is part of our vision. This is part of where we're moving the company. You know, we know that change is really hard in the beginning, ugly in the middle, and beautiful at the end. And you've got to have senior leaders who are talking about that journey so people understand that this is going to be tough, but we're all in it together, and there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's I mean, that's absolutely right. And I think one of the things that is under estimated is actually how long that middle is of the journey yeah. and therefore how, how ugly it can actually really get. That messy time, middle, right. to, That's right. Exactly. Would love to get your thoughts about the uh, kind of the, the key kind of capability gaps if you had. Yeah, and I think, well, I love what Andrew just said. And I think, you know, an, an interesting thing too is, is I don't think there is a point of arrival. I mean, all of us have created right. some sort of in our life that's your point of departure, point of arrival. If we just get to here, we'll be at parity. And then we get to here, we'll be leading edge. And I think it's always a little bit of a, of a misnomer because, you know, customer expectations continue to evolve and there is no real point of arrival. So I think there's just a mindset shift we have to have. And as it relates to the capabilities, I mean, I think, you know, Beth talked a lot about the things that I, I would say is data analytics, data quality, getting all that in place. But I think, you know, one of the capability gaps, I think is, is in, I think this is true for the financial services industry as a whole, is, is we, we've been pretty insular. And I think we, we, we love to sometimes believe that our businesses are so complex that if we don't have experts that have come from our industries, they'll never understand it and they can't have value. And I think you know, having a little bit more of an open mind about bringing in people who, who have been in industries that are 10, 15 years further down the journey than financial institutions are. I mean, in many ways, we complain about the regulatory environment, but the regulatory environment creates a, 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 a protective barrier around a lot of competitors getting in as well. So it's allowed us at times to be a little bit lazy on, on things like this. So when you go to places like retail, consumer packaged goods, big tech, and you can get people who are further down this journey can bring in and, and challenge some of our thinking. And so I think it's, it's, it's the theme that you probably mentioned here is I love this sort of tension between the old guard that knows everything that made a company great and so important to be there to protect you know, people who don't appreciate that from tearing down things that are so critical, important to long-term success, but also fresh thinking from outside the industry that, that doesn't come in with the preconceived ideas of this is how it has to work in insurance or banking or wealth management, et cetera, and actually really press thinking. And so I think when you get into those points of, 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 of constructive tension, 
I think with talent, I think you can actually have some, some step function changes um, in terms of how far you can move. And so to me, I think, you know, that's one of the big things is, is we think about that talent gap to, to not be afraid to bring people in who don't understand your industry. We can teach them the industry. We can, we can get them exposed to that. But what they often can bring is what we don't have is that is that you know, years of scar tissue from other places. And while maybe everything is 100 percent applicable, if you can take 25, 50 percent of what somebody has learned elsewhere and bring it into your shop, you can certainly move much, much quicker and avoid making some mistakes that I think, you know, we can be prone to make if we just continue to always have people that have been in this industry, thought about the same way, attack problems the same way and view it the same way. That's, I mean, that, that is a, uh, that's fantastic. And I, I think I just, I think we're going to we have time for one more question. This is uh, from one of the, the, uh, the uh, participants queue, uh, you know, uh, fielded questions. And this is a, um, this takes a different um, kind of um, aspect of customer centricity. I think one of the things that's really interesting to us at Profit is this idea of, you know, when you think about, um, when you put the customer in the center of what you, uh, what you do and what you build and, and uh, the experiences that you create um, and the value propositions that you put out there, one of the things that is, um, Become, kind of rises more naturally maybe to the forefront is, the, is how do you actually really deal with diverse, how do you handle diversity among your customer segments, right? Because like, you know, what, what I think this is a, some of the common, one of the common themes that we've talked about today in the discussion is, you know, a, a lot of customer centricity really starts with that step of shining a light into the lives of your customers as they are lived and how they interact with your products and value proposition. And then, and then when you do that and you do that, like for, you know, the set of customers that you, uh, you have, you're getting a, a, a broader diversity of points of view and really a, a bigger understanding. I would love to understand from, uh, you know, for uh, Beth, I'll start with you. Like, how do you think about like how customer centricity is related to your efforts around ESG and, and diversity, right? Um, and, and how do you see that as being connected? How do you, is this something that's conscious? Yeah, I think it has to be conscious, but I think it starts with who you are as a brand and it starts with your brand promise and who you want to be in the world. You know, we're a global brand. And so we have to think about all the different areas where we do business and the different kinds of people and cultures and mindsets that come to bear. And you have to decide. We made a conscious decision that we don't want to be a traditional financial services brand. We want to be a very human brand, one that connects with all kinds of people. Because one of the consumer tensions that we heard from our customers was that, oh, financial services companies are just out there to make white men, wealth, wealthy white men, wealthier. And we were like, wait a minute, where did that come from? And so no offense against the white men on the call, but we thought it was really fascinating that there was this concept of a demographic, but also a socioeconomic band that people connected to financial services. It was really fascinating. And so we said, you know what, we want to be a brand, a business that connects with people of all kinds. And so you make, first and foremost, you make that conscious decision of who you want to be as a brand, what your persona is, what your personality is. And then I think once you've done that, you have to make sure that the qualitative research that you do uncovers insights across various demographics, various geographic areas and socioeconomic bands. And you have to think about all those different levers. Um, I love qualitative research. Obviously, I don't bet the farm on it, but I love it because it provides so much insight uh, we did a, a six month study about a year ago globally to really understand at all the different customer types, what was going on in the hearts and minds of consumers. And we learned so much about different age bands versus uh, socioeconomic bands. So I just think, you know, do your homework on who you are, what you want to be, and then talk to your customers about what's important to them. Great. I think we've got uh, one minute left. <laughs> Do we want to uh, wrap it up now, or does anybody have any last yeah. words before we? Uh... Yeah. Any final words? The only thing I would just quickly add, and I think I love what you said, Beth, but I think it's very important for executives to recognize that we're, we often don't represent 
demographically, socio, I mean, any way you cut it economically, we don't represent our customers. And so don't do that focus group in your head. You know, slow down the speed up, do the research, really deeply empathize with our customers, whether it's diverse segments or, or frankly, any of our customers, because it's very easy to, to assume that, that, that we are the person that is we're serving and oftentimes that leads to really bad outcomes. Well, I know we, we are, oh, sorry, go ahead. Somebody was oh, I just said, I completely agree. And I mean, my only last word, Sarab, would be, um, you know, leave a chair open in the room for the customer. Don't forget about them. It's easy to get subsumed by the day-to-day -day of a large organization, especially in these highly matrixed organizations. You have, you have to be the voice and the advocate of your customer segments. And uh, as marketers, I think that's job one for us. Yeah, agreed. Wonderful. Well, I realize we're out of time. Beth, Andrea, Kai, I just want to thank you again for sharing your perspective. It's been such an insightful conversation. I also want to thank our webinar participants who shared the questions, and I hope they found this discussion insightful and, and helpful. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, you know, Profit has published some research on this topic, and if you'd like to dive deeper into the research, uh, the link should be available in the description of this webinar. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.